Math is awesome. Just the whole idea that you can take almost any real-world example and somehow relate it back to math is crazy. Imagine this guy, Archimedes, and it's around 250 BC. One day, he's like, Wait a dang minute! If I put a triangle in the circle and measure the sides... Wait, but if I put this square in? Oh, and this octagon? Oh my Zeus, it's more precise number every time! Hmm, this value here is a constant no matter what the circle radius is. I'll name it... Pi! And long story short, now you have algebra homework. But in all seriousness, math is absolutely everywhere. And today, I'll be showing you a few pretty cool examples. One having to do with sound, and one having to do with visuals. Okay, let's start off with music. On a very basic level, sound is just the rapid compression and decompression of air on your eardrum. You can represent this very simply by using a sine function. Mathematically speaking, a sine function is just y equals the sine of x. But if you want a visual, then the unit circle can help. Here's a circle with a radius of one unit. Imagine a point that travels around the circle once every second at a constant speed. Now take the distance that point is from the x-axis and boom, there's your sine of x value. This is what a sine wave looks like, which just takes the distance from the x-axis and plots it on a graph over time. Going back to sound, this sine wave will now represent the pressure of the sound we are making over time. The difference between the lowest pressure and the highest pressure is the volume of the sound and how often the air compresses and decompresses, otherwise known as the frequency, is what the pitch will be. Right now, this function of y equals the sine of x makes a sound with a volume of one unit, the height of the circle, and a frequency of one cycle per second, or one hertz, which was the time it took for the point to travel once around the circle. This does not sound like anything at all because the frequency is much too low. The very low end of the human hearing spectrum, in fact, is only 20 hertz and goes all the way up to around 20,000 hertz. This equation here, a times the sine of 2 pi times ft, is a controllable sine function where a represents the amplitude or volume of the sound, f represents the frequency of the sound, and t is the elapsed time starting at t equals zero. Meanwhile, the constant value of 2 pi is the circumference of our assumed circle, which has a radius of one unit, and makes it easier to directly input the frequency and time values. Using a piecewise function, which is just putting a few of these functions on a graph but limiting each of them to a certain x value ranges, I can now play a song, using nothing but math. Another cool thing is that you can layer these sine waves on top of each other. Adding two sine waves of different frequencies results in an amplitude difference like shown where the high frequency function is being shifted up and down by the low frequency function. A ton of interesting outcomes can happen when layering these functions from having a sound that fades in and out all the way to having a fully fledged song. But nobody has the time to represent an entire song as an equation, right? Yep, moving on. Now let's go to the visual side of things. Have you ever wondered how cameras, or even your eyes, take something in a three-dimensional space and make it 2D in the form of a picture? No, why would anybody want to learn that? Well, you're in luck, because that's exactly what I'm going to tell you about. Let's think about the basics first. What do we need in order to take a picture in real life? A camera, or eyes, light, and the thing that you're taking a picture of. To take a picture, first, light rays come from the light source and bounce off of any objects they hit and, and scatter in all directions. Some of these light rays go directly towards the camera, while others bounce off with less intensity and hit other objects. Whatever light rays hit the camera are the ones that will be taken into account for the picture. In real life, there are an innumerable amount of rays bouncing off of every surface a ton of times. But there is another way to take a picture. With a computer! It's a process called 3D rendering, and it is used in video games and movies all the time. But since computers are doing it, every single light path and bounce has to be calculated in order to render something. Multiply that by however many frames may be in your animation or video, and that could take a lot of time. But let's do it a bit of a simpler example first by taking a one-dimensional picture in a 2D world. Starting out with an empty coordinate plane, let's add in our three main components of the picture. Here is our subject, a square, then the light, and finally the camera. The light source casts rays of light onto the square, but in this instance, we are using a very small amount of rays for our simulation as opposed to the uncontrollable amount in real life. Depending on how far each ray travels, there will be a certain light amount on the square in the area where it hits. This light falloff can be calculated using what is called the inverse square law, where the light level per unit area is equal to the inverse of the distance the ray travels squared. 
To get the lightness of these points in our square, we can use the Pythagorean theorem to get the distance it takes for each ray to travel, and then plug that distance into the inverse square formula. Now we have a value on a 0 to 1 scale that tells us the percentage of light that will be on that point. Now, when the camera casts its rays to figure out what it's taking a picture of, it can see each color value of each point on the object. But this isn't very useful because there isn't anything connecting the points together. What the camera can do after this is just average the color of the points surrounding any given point to make a cohesive face in the final render. So now, the picture of our square looks a little bit like this. This can be easily transferred over to 3D, but because of the nature of adding another dimension, there will be a lot more things to calculate and take into account. Let's make the same setup in a program called Blender, which is a 100% free 3D rendering program. Here's our subject, the light, and now our camera. And as you can see, depending on where I move the light, there will be a different calculated amount for everywhere on the square. This program here, though, has so much more capability than I already have covered here. We are talking about maybe 5% of what contributes to the math of 3D rendering, the very basics of it. When you add things like color, surface material, different shapes, physical properties, or animation, there's a ton of things that you can do. Here are some examples of some things that I've made in Blender myself. Alright, so I've established that math is an absolutely awesome thing in general. Math can literally be applied to anything in the world. I showed you two examples, being music and cameras, but there's also evolution, the economy, climate change, psychology, art, language, communication, programming. Yeah, math can be, and is, part of everything in our world today. I could talk for a long time about how useful math is. In addition, tons of channels on YouTube, like 3 Blue, one Brown, introduce interesting concepts to wrap your mind around and think about all the time. Mathematics is so much more than doing assignments in math class. It can be a whole world of problem solving and finding cool relationships between random things. And I really hope that I encouraged you to see math in a new light here today. Thank you, and I'll see you later.